first like to know from you uh, what you work in. So could you wave your hand if you work in uh, the physics of the sun or other stars? Anybody? Yeah? OK. What about if you do the heliosphere, the solar wind? OK. And what about if you do Earth ionosphere or magnetosphere? Good. Uh, planetary space physics, anybody? One or two. Good. One person. Great. And then uh, not sure. OK. That's OK. And you can change. You can move between these fields. That's totally OK. OK. That's useful for me. So I'm going to talk about planetary dynamos. And I found this quote, which I just loved. Um, this is from 1600, so a really old quote. May the gods damn all such sham, pilfered, distorted works, which do but muddle the minds of students. Isn't that great? What a great quote. Eh? Anyway, he was interested in navigation, and so realized that he could use a compass uh, to navigate, and then realized that the Earth must have a magnetic field, because he took a piece of magnetite, a piece of rock that was magnetized, and played around with a compass, and then realized, you know, maybe this is how the Earth works. So he came up with this idea that the Earth was a ball with a magnetic field inside. Now, since then, we've been exploring all sorts of magnetospheres, uh, Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, and the heliosphere. And the idea here is just to show you, in terms of scale, you go from relatively small to very, very large. OK, so let's think a bit about dynamos, what's going on. To get a dynamo inside a object, you need three ingredients. You need, um, uh, you need a conducting fluid. It needs to be convecting. And it actually needs to be rotating. And I'm not emphasizing the rotating, because it turns out every object in our solar system rotates enough to get the rotation part. Um, but you need a conducting fluid that is convecting. OK, in this case of the Earth, what is the conducting fluid inside the Earth where the dynamo is? What's it made of? Iron, Iron and nickel, right. OK, and it's convecting. What is the energy that causes the convection? It's the combination of gravitational collapse. So when you make a planet, you have a lot of kinetic energy of objects bumping in and potential energy that's converted into heat inside. That takes a while to dissipate, as well as a little bit of radioactivity. Now, what about the case of Jupiter? Anybody know what the conducting fluid is inside Jupiter? That's not so easy. Yes, it's metallic hydrogen. Yes, liquid hydrogen. High pressures, hydrogen turns into a metal, like mercury. Okay, it has to be about one, uh, two and a half million times the pressure in this room. Uh, and okay, and what about Uranus and Neptune? Anybody know what the Uranus and Neptune conductor is? Okay, we'll come to this in a minute. We'll come to this. Okay, so all objects have enough rotation. Uh, and then what happens is that you have these flows. Let me just go back. I don't know if this works. Is this? Yes. Um, what happens inside is if you have some convection and some rotation, you end up making these cylindrical flows or more turbulent flows, different flows in different objects. Um, but the net result, and this is a simulation uh, of the Earth, you end up with material rotating around, producing fields that come out of one end and in at the other end. OK, so that's a sort of roughly dipolar magnetic field that you produce. OK, now when we look at these different objects, and so I'm showing you here to scale Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. And indeed, liquid metallic hydrogen is this dark color inside Jupiter and Saturn. And you can see it's much larger. Jupiter is three times, 300 times the mass of the Earth, so three times the mass of Saturn. Saturn is about 100 times the mass of the Earth. So you can see you've got a lot more pressure and a much larger volume that is metallic hydrogen in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, so a much stronger field. When you look at the magnetic moment relative to the Earth, so one, obviously, for the Earth, 
much less for Ganymede and Mercury. Ganymede is a moon of what planet? Ganymede? A moon of which? Yes? Jupiter, right? Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, the four Galilean moons. And that is the only moon that has its own magnetic field, its own dynamo. So this is the, this is the situation that we have for Jupiter and Saturn, very strong, 20,000 times stronger than the Earth, or 600 times stronger than the Earth for Saturn, a smaller volume. Uh, and then for Uranus and Neptune, you actually have ionic water, that is like seawater, where you have material dissolved in it. So in the case of seawater, we have sodium chloride. You have similar sort of materials, we think, dissolved in these um, uh, oceans, which then convect and make the dynamo. Much weaker fields uh, again, but still stronger than the Earth. OK, so this big comparison is really strong between the Earth and Jupiter, as we've already mentioned. Now, when you make a simple approximation to a magnetic field, you can use the simple dipole, bar magnet. And Bob's already talked about how the north and south for the Earth is kind of opposite. If you look at Jupiter, you really do have the field coming out of the north and in at the south. Um, and then Uranus and Neptune, you have this really strange situation where not only is the uh, dipole tilted with respect to the spin axis by a really large angle, not just the 10 degrees that we have at Earth and Jupiter, but, but 59 and 47 degrees. Uh, but it's also offset. Now, this is the a tilted dipole, which is a very uh, simple approximation. In reality, when you look at magnetic fields, uh, you need to look at more complexity. And this is the usual way that we deconvolve uh, complex things like magnetic fields or gravity fields and so on. And you can write out mathematically the combinations of coefficients and the structures corresponding to those higher order uh, moments of the magnetic field. Uh, you have many more pieces here. It's more complex. So we often like to look at the dipole component and the quadrupole component. Right? That gives you a sense of complexity when you go to higher order. And when we look at the planets and the dynamos of the magnetic fields, you can see that for Jupiter, Earth, and Saturn, you have a dipole here. And then you have a quadrupole, which is less, and then a high order mo moments which, which continue low. But Uranus and Neptune, their multipole coefficients are very high, and you have this very high degree of complexity. So this offset tilted weird dipole configuration for Uranus and Neptune is, in fact, a highly complex multipole magnetic field. And the idea is that the dynamo happens in a relatively weak conductor fairly close to the surface of the planet. Now, can you name another object in our solar system that has a very non-dipolar magnetic field because the dynamo is relatively close to the surface in a fairly thin region? The sun, right? So the sun is a situation where rotation is relatively weak, and you have a thin shell dynamo. OK, so um, what we have now when we look at these basic planetary dynamos is the Earth and Jupiter have these tilted magnetic fields, dipoles, roughly dipolar, opposite directions. Saturn has a very dipolar magnetic field, and it's very, very tightly aligned with the rotation axis, which is a little weird. People had a hard time explaining that. We'll maybe come back to that uh, towards the end. And then here again are the Uranus and Neptune, very non-dipolar magnetic fields. And one way you can quantify um, this non-dipolar nature is to take a ratio of the quadrupole to the dipole, which is small for Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, and large for Uranus and Neptune. OK. So when you fly past a planet or you map a planet, you fly around it and make multiple observations, when you get closer and uh, map more detailed, you find more complexity. And this is actually the Earth's magnetic field, where you go down to the top of the dynamo, you can see there's a lot of complexity there. And indeed, we also know that the Earth's magnetic field flips 
And this is a, um, showing you that over a period of many hundreds of years, the uh, field flips from one direction to the other. Let me um, go back and run that again. There we go. Starts off blue at the bottom and orange on top. And then over a period of time, you'll see that it goes the other way around. Okay, with orange down here and blue at the top. Now, the Earth's magnetic field goes through this um, system. Uh, it takes a while to do this, uh, roughly every 200,000 years. So this isn't something that happens frequently. It's, it's rare, but it, we've been able to measure it by looking at um, uh, the, the magnetic field that's frozen into the magma in the ocean crust. So as the plates move apart and you measure the magnetic field as you go across away from the continental center towards the, towards the continents, you see different polarities of the magnetic field. And you can measure the age by using uh, isotopic um, aging of the rocks. And what you find is there are actually periods where there's no change in the magnetic field. It stays at one particular orientation. And then in between, you have areas where it's flipping back and forth and flipping back and forth. Now, the exact region reason for this variability of the dynamo is not understood. Dynamo theorists have a long way to go to model these things. Um, but this is what we know about the Earth, a lot of complexity. And what's also cool is that the, you look at the geomagnetic pole and the magnetic pole of the Earth, they seem to be moving and moving quickly. OK, what is the difference? What is a geomagnetic pole versus a magnetic pole? Can you think how they may be different? Anybody? Yes. So one of them is the dipole, and where the dipole intersects if you fit the whole of the Earth's magnetic field with a dipole, you say, this is a tilted dipole. OK, simple. OK, you're right. Now, the other one, how else might you define a magnetic field pole, particularly when it's a more complicated field? Yes? Sorry? When it's orthogonal to the surface, when it's coming out of the surface. Absolutely, that's right. So where the magnetic pole is where BR, B equals BR, right, the radial component, and then the geomagnetic pole, the best fit dipole. Now, if you look at the geomagnetic pole, the north, it's somewhere here in Canada, right? Hasn't moved a whole lot. And the south is there, down there in Antarctica. But when you look at the magnetic pole, that is the BR, which includes the complexity of the non-dipole component, first of all, you see that the magnetic pole in the south is, is charging away from the South Pole towards, I think that's towards Argentina, but I'm not 100% certain, but away from the South Pole. But look to the north. It's going charging from Canada over to Russia. Look, look at that, 2015. It's probably over here by now. OK, what's going on there? Hmm, interesting. Let's not read any politics into this, but you know one could have some fun with it. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? Well, you know, if the field is, is really complicated, then you're going to find multiple places where the field is where BR equals B equals BR. I believe that for the Earth, there is only one place, but I could be wrong. OK, good. That's a very good question. Certainly for Uranus and Neptune, that's not the case. There's multiple places. Similarly, the sun. The sun has lots of places where that's the case. Center of all the sunspots is a good example. Great. Good. OK, so now let's go to Jupiter's magnetic field. Very strong, as we've all already mentioned. The Juno spacecraft is in orbit around Jupiter, mapping the magnetic field. Gets pretty close. And what we're finding, the, the sixth orbit, the seventh orbit, um, it's a deviate, the observations, the data, which is in black, is beginning to deviate from the uh, previous models. And so we're getting some hints that the dynamo region may actually be closer to the surface. And there are some asymmetries. The north has a stronger field than the south. And we're seeing that there are anomalies. So this is an equatorial anomaly, similar to the South American anomaly for the Earth. 
right? Maybe you've been, if you studied the Earth's ionosphere, you'll know um, that the South American anomaly is very important for ionospheric dynamics. Okay, so this is what we're finding at Jupiter. We're also finding from measuring the gravity field that the simple picture of a core, a, a metallic region, and then a, a molecular top layer, it's not as simple as that. It's more complicated. You've got more mixing lower down, and so um, the, the region of metallic hydrogen is, is more up here with a mixture of heavy uh, materials from below, a, a bigger core. Now, if we look at the dynamo field, I showed this earlier from Glatzmeier, where you have these motions inside generating a roughly dipolar field. When we look at Saturn, what we have is a situation where um, we have more flows that are, in fact, um, the, the, the boundary between the conducting core and the outer layer uh, is not so clear. There's some resistivity, and that leads to winding up of the um, magnetic field around the core, and so you end up making it very symmetric and aligned with the magnetic field. Uh, and then when we go to, to Jupiter, uh, we would expect, because of the rapid rotation, to have cylinders, the dynamo in cylinders like this, around a heavy elements uh, dissolved in this. But what I wonder, and we've not got the answer to this yet, the dynamo theorists have work to do, is what is going on in these regions above and below? Do you have continuation of the dynamo there? And if so, could this be an explanation of why the north and south are so different? Okay. So these data are in. They've just been coming in the past year or two. We're trying to work out what's going on. But this, as you can see, could probably have a lot of applications across exoplanets and so on and so forth, trying to understand the dynamo and what goes on in different regions of a dynamo. OK, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the smaller, rocky planets closer to the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, and Mars. Which of these have magnetic fields? Uh, Mercury? Yes, no? Venus? Earth? Yes. Moon? Mars? Some, some wondering there. Okay, yes, no, yes, no. Um, why don't Venus and Mars have dynamos? Yeah. Yes? OK, I'm coming to it. Just uh, two slides. And if, it, if I don't address your question, wave your hand again. OK. So Mars and Venus don't have dynamos, OK? There's enough rotation. That's probably not the problem. Um, and I, this is what Dave Stevenson from, from Caltech, professor in this field, and so he's the, the big guy in this field, he says, um, really, what's happening is probably that you've got a lack of conve convection. And so the question is, is this because there's not enough heat in the deep interior to heat it from below and turn it over? Or is it that you don't have enough temperature gradient? That is, the top isn't cooling off fast enough. In the case of Venus, right, um, that you're not cooling off the top that would drive this temperature gradient that would drive the convection. So we really don't know, and we really need geophysics missions to Venus and to Mars. They just landed a seismometer on Mars. They may begin to understand this. But for Venus, our sister planet, right? we know very little about why and what's going on. So these are things we need to do in the future. OK, so crustal magnetism. Um, we do know. When we look at the degree of complexity, so this is power as a function of degree of complexity. When we look at the Earth, we have the dipolar, non-dipolar, and we go down like this. And at some point, we hit the complexity associated with remnant magnetization of the rocks. So when the crust is molten, it receives the magnetic field of that time that freezes. And then it freezes with that magnetic field of that particular time. So we're able to, to get a map of the magnetic field flipping of the Earth as a function of time. 
using that magnetic field frozen into the crust. Now, for Mars, we have remnant magnetization. No question about that. And it looks similar in many ways in terms of degree of complexity. And so the idea is that the moon probably, sorry, I should say also the moon also has some um, remnant magnetization, much lower extent, weaker. Uh, but the question then is, did the moon ever have a dynamo? Maybe, probably very small, because it was a very tiny little core. If it had any, this remnant magnetization could have just come from solar wind into planetary magnetic field. Uh, but for Mars, the idea is that what may have been a dynamo, but when you look at where the crustal magnetism is, it suggests that, in fact, the dynamo died um, by about more than three and a half billion years ago. Okay, so you can measure the age of a crust by looking at the number of impacts. It's a very old crust. It's got a lot of impacts. And so we know from looking at the crustal magnetization that the Mars dynamo died a long time ago. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so then let's think about this. We have a very uh, weak, irregular magnetic field. Most of it seems to be in the south. And what that does is it sort of pushes out into the solar wind. You get a lump, bumpy surface, and you have a changing topology as the interplanetary magnetic field goes by. So what's interesting, and uh, I'm just going to show this one slide, is that when you look at all of these objects that don't have magnetic fields but do have atmospheres, when the solar wind goes past these atmospheres, and we've been making measurements with a bunch of spacecraft, what's interesting is on an absolute scale that's the same for all of these objects, right? even though we're going from Venus down to Pluto to a tiny little comet, the interaction scale, scale of the interaction with the solar wind, is about the same. It looks as if uh, this, they have a similar atmospheric escape, except for comets, where it varies a lot. When they get close to the sun, it's a lot more. But they have a similar interaction scale. OK, so they're actually fairly similar, which is sort of interesting. OK, so let's talk about magnetospheres. And um, indeed, Bob has set me up very nicely with this. Um, we're going to go back and, and uh, talk about this business. And, and Chapman and Ferraro back in the 30s started thinking about what if you were to put a, a, a bar magnet into a background magnetic field. So we have an obstacle, which is the magnetic field. We have the supersonic solar wind. The supersonic solar wind produces a bow shock uh, upstream, and the size of the magnetosphere the magnetosphere, the magnetopause, is sort of about one and uh, 1.3 times. Uh, sorry, the bow shock is about 1.3 times that magnetopause distance. Uh, and then, um, what the bow shock is doing, as as Bob has said, you're converting kinetic energy of the supersonic solar wind into thermal energy. You're diverting the flow around, and you have um, you have a little less ram pressure at the magnetopause um, because of that. Um, I'm just going to mention the smallest magnetospheres, Mercury and Ganymede. These are very weak magnetic fields. And um, uh, what you have here is a very small magnetosphere. The G Ganymede one is inside the magnetosphere of Jupiter, so it's not a sub subsonic upstream, no bow shock. Um, but these are going to be explored a lot more. Bepi Colombo is on its way to uh, Mercury, and JUICE will be exploring the magnetosphere of Ganymede uh, in the next-ish decade. Uh, Mercury, Bob mentioned that the scale of the magnetosphere is, in fact, hitting the surface. Normally, it's not quite hitting the surface, the solar wind, but it stands off a little way. Uh, and then, But there are times of extreme conditions when you are, uh, the solar wind is ramming the surface. And because the scale is very small and the magnetic, the magnetic field is strong and the solar wind is strong in at Mercury, you have a very rapid dungy cycle turning things over. You know, you think of your dungy dance is going nuts right on this little magnetosphere. OK, so let's talk a little bit about this standoff distance, the Chapman-Ferraro current, and the derivation of that formula. 
um, that we've been applying to the scale of the magnetosphere. And so basically, the idea is that you're balancing pressures, as Bob said, between the ram pressure of the solar wind coming in and the magnetic field pressure uh, of the inside. And you end up uh, balancing those pressures. But if you look in detail, what you end up doing, because the electrons and the ions respond a little differently to this sharp boundary, you end up driving a current with the electrons and the ions moving relative to each other. And that uh, produces a J cross B force uh, across the magnetopause. OK. Now, you can describe this. If you, this was originally done when you had fields at the same inside and out, so the solar wind magnetic field in the planetary magnetic field pointing northwards, as it is inside, you then end up producing, you can describe the, the chapman ferrara currents on the surface of the magnetopause. And you can see it's a lot more complicated than the simple diagrams that are drawn. But it gives you a sense. And this gives you the closed magnetosphere. OK. So then what happens? Uh, how do we actually calculate that chapman ferrara distance, that standoff distance? So you take the dipole magnetic field. So this is 1 over r cubed, as Bob mentioned. You take the ram pressure, and then you balance them. Now, it turns out that if you've got, you, you can either describe it as compression, which is what Bob said, you, you, you um, weaken the solar wind because of the compression. Or you can say, well, this current associated with the magnetopause is a net effect of increasing the magnetic field or the, the, the size of the obstacle. You end up with a formulation of balancing the pressures, and then you solve for the distance of the magnetopause where those pressures are balanced. And you end up with this classic chapman ferrara distance, scaling the magnetopause distance to the size of the planet. And you will see it has, depends on the strength of the magnetic field, stronger magnetic field, bigger magnetosphere. And then it depends inversely with the solar wind pressure, higher solar wind pressure, smaller magnetosphere. So let's think about this. We have our obstacle. We have our ram pressure. We have our magnetic field, uh, our magnetic pressure. And when you write it out in terms of the right units, ratio here, so this has to be dimensionless, then you end up with this term. OK, so let's think a little bit more about this. Um, we've, this is the formulation, OK? I want you to chat with your neighbors. And we're going to, I'm going to give you um, two minutes to pick one of these questions and uh, come up with an answer. And we'll go through and do this together. OK, so pick a question and think about what the answer would be, just as proportionality, taking the equation up here and thinking about what happens. And so actually, you're probably going to have to go down from the top. I don't think you can solve the bottom one without knowing the top ones. Hey, I didn't know you were going to be here. Good to see you, mate. Great. Excellent. Good. Catch up afterwards. Great. Anybody stuck? Are you doing OK? Are you coming through them, working through it? What is the physical principle you do to solve the first one? Mass conservation, right? So you think of stuff flowing out in a radial direction. It kind of helps to know the answer to number two. What's the answer to number two? No, not really. Yeah, it's constant, right? So if v is, is, is constant, rho v squared is how the, the, uh, the, the, the solar wind density is going to vary, right? So if rho v squared is constant with distance, right, the area that it's going to go through varies as uh, r squared. And so what is the um, solar wind 
variation with distance from the sun going to be? It, first of all, does it go up or go down? It goes down as a power. What power? Two, right? Squared, one over R squared. OK, that one's constant. OK, so now what does 1 over rho solar wind u squared to the 6? How does that vary with distance? What do you think? Minus 1? Oh, a third. A third. Cube root. OK. OK, if that's cube root, if you took the Earth from 1 AU to 8 AU, what would happen to its size? Would it get bigger or smaller? Get bigger because the density goes down, right? How much bigger? OK, I conveniently chose 8 for a good reason. I can do the cube root of 8. Can you? OK. So the answer is 1 over d squared, constant, 1 over d cube root, cube root of d. And so this would be a factor of 2. So if you took the Earth's magnetic sphere out to, um, nearly, nearly out to Saturn, it would be twice its size. Right? Isn't that cool? OK, so that's a useful exercise. So now when we look at Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, we've got got the values of the surface magnetic fields. And you know, the problem is space physicists, they like to, some people like to use Gauss, some people like to use nanotesla, some people like to use microteslas. The units are all over the place, so you'll see different numbers in my presentation, depending on, on you know, you just have to learn how to convert from one to the other. Um, but if you, if you, you can see the strong magnetic field of Jupiter. This is the calculated chapman ferrari distance. So you take the formula, you put in the solar wind, you put in the magnetic field, this is what you get. Okay. So the Earth is about 10, right? That's sort of what Bob said. Isn't that what you said, Bob? More or less 10? For Mercury, it's about 1.4, right? So when the field gets, when the, the RAM pressure gets strong, it actually does go to the surface. But for Jupiter, it's about 46, Saturn 20, Uranus and Neptune 25. Now, look at the actual numbers observed. And you will see we've got a problem with Jupiter and Saturn, right? Particularly Jupiter. That's not too bad. It's pretty much as, as, as predicted. We have a problem with Jupiter. OK, we'll come back to this. A bit for Saturn, but not so much. The real reason, of course, is that it isn't just a dipole magnetic field inside. We have to worry about these moons, Eo, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and in particular, Eo, my favorite, covered in volcanoes, right? There's about 400 volcanoes on the surface, not a single impact crater, and they're all spewing out gases. And we know this because when New Horizons went by, Tvashtar was erupting sulfur dioxide and dust and all sorts of really cool stuff. OK. And then now, with Juno, we've flown by. And look at these red, hot, this is infrared, lava. <laughs> Eat your heart out, killer wear. This is way bigger than anything on Hawaii. OK, totally cool. And the net result is EO ejects a ton a second. So that's a pickup truck every second of material into the outside in area. And a million amp currents couple EO to the planet. OK, totally cool. Lots of cool stuff. OK, I mean, hot stuff. It's really hot. OK, never mind. OK, so let's talk about dynamics. And what we're interested in here is the relationship between the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, the solar wind. And Bob's, Bob's talked a lot about this, and we'll talk more about it tomorrow. We have the ionosphere solar wind coupling, which gives us the Dungy cycle. We have ionosphere and the magnetosphere coupling. That gives us rotating magnetospheres or rotating plasma sphere. And then if you couple the solar wind and the magnetosphere without involving the ionosphere, you have a viscous interaction. Okay? 
So really, these are the main three components that we're worried about. And then we look at the relationships between them. We can have these three different processes. So we'll, we'll talk about these at, uh, a bit at a time. So here's the Dungey cycle where you have the ionosphere and the solar wind interacting. And you have this opening on the day side and closing on the night side and circulating through the magnetosphere. And so here we go from the uh, closed magnetosphere where the upstream uh, field is the same direction as the inside to the opposite. And the, this, of course, is the extreme case. And it could be as long as you've got a component of that upstream field um, uh, opposing the interior, you'll get this open magnetosphere and, and reconnection happening. OK, so this is the Dungey cycle with the opening and the closing. But you also need to look down on the magnetosphere and see this is the X line, where you have the reconnection happening in the tail. And you have the flow recycling, and as Bob said, going around towards the front side. OK? But there's a region inside, which is this rotating plasma sphere at, in the case of the Earth. OK? And so you have the Dungey cycle on the outside, but inside there is a rotating plasma sphere. Uh, and that's the boundary between corrotation and convection. So this is, this is the description I'm going to give you of this um, solar wind-driven magnetospheric convection. And strictly speaking, it's not actually convection. Like you think of convection being where you have a bowl of soup and you put the heat below and it turns over. It is actually, technically speaking, advection, like a wind flowing, carrying material from A to B. Uh, or circulation. Now, I'm going to give you what is the conventional approach, which is the called the EJ approach, where we talk about electric fields and currents, the trendy way, um, which people like Gene Parker and Vitenis Vassalunis have been pushing now for over a decade, is, is to talk about B and V, not E and J. Um, but I'm going to stick with the trad more traditional way. So if you have. Um, if you have a solar wind going by and you have a B up here in the, so up in the solar wind, um, you have an electric field that goes across the magnetosphere. So you have V, you have B, and then you have E right in this frame. And looking down, you have this system here. And so the crude approximation is this electric field is a convection electric field that drives the convection in the tail. It's pretty uniform across the magnetosphere. So here, you have E, you have a B into the plane, you have a V being driven this way. Okay? This is the sort of standard, I think this is probably how Chen describes it, or the standard way of, of doing it. Um, though, of course, there are other ways of describing it using the B and V without involving J. So the net result is you end up with a, um, a V, a convection speed that depends on um, the, how strongly you're driving this reconnection. And we've got this fudge factor, squiggle, which is the efficiency of this reconnection. And um, maybe Bob will talk more about this tomorrow or not. OK, someone mentioned, well, what happens in the ionosphere? Well, you've got to think about this flow coming back through the magnetosphere. What is happening at the end of those magnetic fields? And somebody raised this in Bob's lecture. What's happening when you're looking into the ionosphere, you have the polar region, you have this flow going across. So this is the part of the Dungey cycle where you're going over the top. And then you have this return flow. And the net result is going to be a flow around like this in the ionosphere. Right? And you can imagine there's going to be currents, electrical currents associated with that coupling between the ionosphere and the uh, outer edge of the, of the magnetosphere. Okay. And indeed, this tends to be more or less, though not rigorously, the region of where the aurora is. Okay. So now let's talk about the ionosphere-magnetosphere coupling, where we end up with a rotating plasma sphere. So think about this. You have um, some co-rotation 
um, speed, some co-rotation vector like this, spinning around here. And, um, and then the co-rotation out somewhere away from that axis will be omega cross r. So out here, you'll have stuff going around, co-rotating the planet. And what makes it co-rotate are the electrical currents that flow between the ionosphere and the magnetosphere out here. And that enforces the co-rotation of the material out in the magnetosphere. Okay, And so in the case here of a plasma sphere, plasma pores, inside you're going to have a co-rotational electric field, co-rotational motion. And outside, you're going to have convection driven by the solar wind. So we can take the co-rotational speed and the convection speed that we got from the Dungy cycle with that reconnection efficiency there and compare these two and find out what fraction of the magnetosphere is, is rotating with the planet and what fraction is being driven by the Dungy cycle. And you can think of that as being scaling the size of the co-rotating plasma pores to the size of the planet. And in the case of the Earth, here with this relatively small plasma pores, that scales about six and a half, six or so. And if you put the numbers in for Jupiter, you get a number that's about 350. So Jupiter is heavily dominated by rotation, whereas the Earth, it's only partially rotating in the plasma sphere. Mostly, it's Dungy cycle outside. OK. As Bob said, the reality is messy. And you look at the real configurations, you get all sorts of uh, uh, magnetic fields getting wrapped around. And in the tail, things also get messy with this um, truculent little boy getting all fed up and not wanting to reconnect until he gets bullied to and driving material through the magnetic tail. OK, more about that tomorrow. Let's talk about sources of plasma. And these are very different across the different magnetospheres. Again, just like the strength of the magnetic field. And um, we have to think about the strength. Now, I've already mentioned that EO produces about a ton a second. Enceladus also produces water, spews out water. Um, we don't have much plasma at Uranus and Neptune. For the Earth, we have a combination of material coming from the ionosphere and some stuff leaking in from the solar wind. Indeed, this is the diagram that, that, similar to what Bob showed, where you have open magnetic fields, you have some solar wind material coming in. But it's also interesting to know that as the material comes out of the ionosphere, it goes into the tail and becomes energized in the tail, in the tail region. Um, so what happens when we look as a function of energy OK, so blue is lower energy, and red is high energy. You can see the plasma sphere and the material flowing out of the polar region of the Earth is fairly low energy, ionospheric temperatures being really low. right? Um, and then this material becomes heated up as it goes into the tail. And then when the material comes back in that pinging, as you accelerate particles from the tail, you end up accelerating particles that come back in and producing hot plasma around the outside of the plasma sphere. Okay. So you've got a range of different energies um, depending on the history of the particles. Now, when we look at Jupiter, we have this ton of second coming from EO. Uh, and so we have a region. The material comes out of EO. It becomes ionized. It's actually ionized by electron impact ionization. And it ionizes this ton a second. It slowly moves out and uh, is replaced in about 50 days. But you have this gas, and this is a real observation of UV emission from this gas, this plasma torus emitting. You can see it's wobbling with the 10 degree tilt of the magnetic field of Jupiter. Um, but this is a dense material trapped in the magnetic field of Jupiter. So you have this strong interaction of flow going past its subsonic flow so you don't have a shock upstream. You pull off the ionosphere and atmosphere, becomes ionized, 
and stripped away, producing neutral particles, and then those neutral particles become ionized. And again, um, you get this million amp currents flowing between Jupiter and Io. More about that in a bit. Now, when material comes out and it becomes ionized, so you have a neutral particle, oxygen or sulfur, when it sees the surrounding plasma, and when it becomes ionized, it begins to gyrate, and it gets accelerated up to co-rotate with the rest of the material. But along the way, it gets accelerated. It gains this large gyro motion, and that large gyro motion um, is basically uh, giving heat. It's at making hot ions, pickup ions. The ions are relatively hot. They have large gyro motion whereas the electrons are relatively cold because they're very light. And so if you're going to pick up the plasma flow and convert that into um, thermal energy, you're going to end up with very hot, uh, heavy ions and relatively cold electrons. Now, this pickup motion is actually throughout our solar, our, not just our solar system, but our heliosphere. Does anybody know of a place in the heliosphere where this pickup process plays a major role in the plasma? Yes. The question is this. Where in the heliosphere, other than the Eoplasma torus, or even other than um, uh, Saturn's magnetosphere, where in the heliosphere do we have this pickup process where neutrals become ionized, pick up a lot of um, gyro motion. So you end up with hot ions that have picked up the local flow speed. Pick up ions from the interstellar medium. So what is happening there is that material from the interstellar medium, hydrogen and helium, neutral material, comes into past our solar system, past our heliosphere. And at some point, they become ionized, mostly due to um, photoionization of UV light from the sun. They immediately see the solar wind. And so they begin to pick up a gyro motion of that 400 kilometers a second solar wind speed. And so they pick up. They become KEV um, ions in the outer, uh, outer solar system. So these pick up, interstellar pickup ions play a major role in the pressure of the outer part of the, of the heliosphere. And in fact, this pickup process slows down the solar wind. Momentum, energy has to come from somewhere. It comes from the solar wind. If you slow down the solar wind, you add this pressure of hot particles from the interstellar pickup process. So this is actually, um, th throughout our, our uh, heliosphere, there are various places where this process of pickup happens. Now, the energy of the pickup ions, let me go back, of the Eoplasma torus, this energy goes into the ions. But what happens is those ions uh, interact, collide with the electrons. They become excited. The ions get excited and radiate. And this is the ultraviolet emission, a whole bunch of sulfur and oxygen ions. And we observe this using the Cassini uh, instrument flying by on its way to Saturn, or the Hisaki satellite, the JAXA satellite that's in orbit around the Earth. We can measure these UV emissions and use them as a diagnostic of the composition inside. OK, so then what happens to this material that is produced by EO produces this EO torus. So you have material that's being added to the plasma. So you've got plasma trapped by the magnetic field. It's co-rotating with Jupiter every 10 hours. Okay, so it's got a lot of co-rotational energy. Then what happens? Well, if you think of two neighboring flux tubes, okay, these are dipolar flux tubes, more or less. And if you add more material to A, you keep adding in material. right? And remembering that this is co-rotating every 10 hours, you're going to have a lot of centripetal energy associated with that. Okay. What will happen is, if you've got, uh, if you interchange these two, then you will um, release energy. Okay. 
So what happens is you, you, you interchange these two, and the stuff that was in, in close starts to move out, and the empty flux tubes that were in B, they come inwards. Okay? So what happens is that if you have EO here, a distance of about 6, you'll have much more faster outward motion, whereas the inward motion will be slower. right? Because on the inward side, you've got more, mo more stuff in B. It's going to be hard to compress it and bring it inwards. Um, whereas with the beyond sex, beyond the source, you'll have more stuff in A, and it'll be releasing energy when you interchange these flux tubes. So we get outward transport from the location of EO out into the magnetosphere. So what happens when this material moves out? Well, if you think of the skater, and I'm not going to do a very good demonstration of this because I'm not very good at skating, but think of a, a skater, arms in, right? S when they put, ooh, get dizzy, put their arms out, right? They slow down, right? Conservation of angular momentum, right? You've seen the demonstrations in your physics labs. So you would say that as the plasma moves out from EO, conserving angular momentum, it should slow down, OK? But it is coupled by the magnetic field to this spinning planet. Jupiter's not going to slow down. Jupiter's got 320 times the mass of the Earth. It's going to keep spinning, OK? And so electrical currents couple this plasma to the co-rotating planet, and they keep it co-rotating. Okay? And so the, the, the uh, angular momentum is conveyed from the planet to the plasma, keeps it co-rotating, and you have these um, enforcement currents that keep it, keep it co-rotating. Okay. Uh, so this is a g continued plasma coupling between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. Now, what happens when you have these currents flowing is that you, in fact, are going to end up with an uh, azimuthal current in the equatorial region. And this is sort of what we observe in the, in the, in the plasma sheet, because you're going to stretch out. You stretch out the magnetic field. And so you end up, because you're going to add more material out here, you stretch out the magnetic field. And that's equivalent to having a, an azimuthal current going around. You also have these coupling currents between the planet and the plasma sheet. These are radial currents. And the net result of this, so we observe uh, these currents in terms of a perturbation of the magnetic field. Similarly, we know that to uh, keep those currents continuous, we have to have parallel um, currents coupling between the planet and the plasma sheet. Now, the manifestation of these currents is to produce not a simple dipole field, but a distorted dipole field, where you stretch out the magnetic field in this azimuthal from the sideways view. And then the net result of this radial current is to produce a bend back when you're looking down. So the magnetic field of Jupiter is uh, only dipolar in close to the planet. And the effect of the coupling between the plasma sheet and the planet produces these distorted magnetic fields. OK, so I want to talk a bit about the aurora, because the aurora is uh, directly related to these coupling currents, as you might imagine. So. Uh, Think of this magnetosphere of Jupiter. Remember, the scale is between 60 and 100 RJ, so really big in scale. Uh, EO is in at 6. And the main aurora is in at about 20 RJ. Okay, So it's really about a fifth of the way, or third to a fifth of the way, between the planet and the magnetopause. It's not right on the boundary, uh, as we tend to have for the Earth. And this aurora is produced, uh, associated with this coupling between the plasma sheet and the planet. And we know there are upward currents that convey that angular momentum from the planet to the plasma. 
and there are downward currents that we know are going down to complete that coupling. Uh, but what happens uh, at these high latitudes, we don't know. Now, in the case of Jupiter, we know that most of the plasma is confined to the equator. Think of it as spinning around, spinning around. The plasma will get flung out to the furthest point along that fill line as it spins around. And so you'll have a relatively empty region at high latitudes. And a lot of people, including Bob, who's conveniently left the room, have been studying this physics at the Earth, where you get impedance regions, double layers, potential drops. You've probably heard some of these words. We'll talk more about them. Are thought to happen at high latitudes, where you have an impedance uh, and you have an acceleration of particles. And you can imagine, if you have a region up here of acceleration of particles, you might be making aurora. Okay. So what we want to know is, let me just go back a second. We have this coupling between the plasma sheet and the ionosphere. And um, we've been saying that these currents along the field are driven by um, the need to convey angular momentum from the planet to the plasma. So my question to you is this. When you've got a blob of plasma out here that is moving outwards, wants to slow down to conserve angular momentum, yet is coupled to this spinning planet, how does it know that it's coupled to the planet? What is the physical process where information is conveyed from the spinning planet to the plasma? And similarly, if you have stresses associated with the solar wind interaction or something, the outer part of the magnetosphere, how is that communicated from the outside to the planet? What is the physical process whereby information is transferred along the magnetic field in a plasma? And actually, it's pretty much all plasmas, not just magnetospheres. magnetic tension. So you're thinking of a field line, and you're twinging it so you have tension. You're, you're going in the right direction. So I don't know. Have we got Bob's magnetic field? Where did Bob's magnetic field go? Nope, that's not it. Nope. We've lost this magnetic field. Well, he's run off with it. Here, let's use this. Let's use this. Okay. And can you can you can you do, do help me? For next year, I'll put on my yes, yes. string. Just oh, yeah, magnetic field. Get one one quick announcement. Yes. So we it turns out buses screwed up again. We have lots of time. Uh oh. So after this, we can take a five minute break. Okay. Good. Okay. So this is our magnetic field. We talked about tension, right? So if you can think of tension bending the magnetic field, what happens when you bend a magnetic field? What happens to that bend? How does it propagate? Say I go like this, Alphane wave, right? Boom, along the field, right? So you sent alphane waves along here, right? Now, V alphane, thank you, is proportional to two quantities. Anybody remember? B square root of rho, OK? And so if you have a strong field and a weak density, it propagates quickly, right? So you can see you're going to propagate very quickly the alphane wave between um, the inner magnetosphere and the outer magnetosphere. It's going to happen quickly, right? But once you move out into the magnetosphere, you've still got a fair amount of density, but the field is decreasing like crazy. So your alphane speed is decreasing, 
and it gets harder and harder for the plasma out here to communicate with the planet. So you might want to think about that alpha in travel time compared with the co-rotation time, right? And if that alpha in travel time gets to be long compared with that rotation time, you're going to decouple your plasma sheet from your rotation source, OK? And with that thought, you want to take a five-minute break. OK, quickie. Good. I, I want to tell you, I want to get to Uranus. Weird, weird. Back to Uranus fits, right? We got to get there. OK, good. So take a quick break. Okay. Okay, I'm going to have to skip some pieces. What am I going to skip? Help, oh, panic. Okay. Right, we'll see how we do. We'll see how we do. Okay. Right, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Good. Yeah. Right. 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 Right, so that is a potential field, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You're, you're ignoring the external currents, right? So this is only to understand the internally generated dynamo. And you, you have to, to do that, you have to subtract what you might think of as, okay, so as you, the yeah, only looking at the internal component. Yeah, like and you have to either remove or you have to compensate for, you know, uh, coupling currents, or auroral currents, or magnetopause currents or currents in the tail. So it gets to be tricky to do that accurately uh, in, you know, unless you have a really strong internal field. So when we go to Jupiter, we don't have to worry about the others too much because it's all pretty much interior. But then when you go, go to the Earth, you know, those polar currents causing the aurora get to be important. So they don't do a very good job of getting the internal field. Yeah, you have to do, you actually have to, you have to go to a hot, you can't, you, you have to use, um, yeah, you, there, there are a variety of ways of doing that, um, but you, yes, have to include those extra currents. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Yes, there's 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 gradient drifts. There's a lot of gradient drifts. And um, yeah, yeah. Right. So I suspect Bob will come back to this tomorrow when he talks about the tail and the Earth's tail. It gets to be important. Yeah. You know, a lot of the time, I don't. Those, these are areas that 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 are not necessarily particularly well defined. People tend to pick the favorite drift that they think is the most important. <laughs> There's a little bit of that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so particularly for the Earth's radiation belts, that's a big deal because those drifts are very important for accelerating particles and, and moving particles around at higher energies. When we talk about the low energy thermal plasma, they're not so important. Yeah, yeah, good point, very good. Yeah. Ah. Right, right. So you do have atmospheric erosion. Um, 
and indeed the magnetosphere, uh, the interaction with, with uh, Mars is stripping off the atmosphere. Exactly. Yeah, and Pluto. But um, uh, y what happens is you have ionization of the outer layers, and then those, you can have currents. Once you have ionization, you can have electrical currents. And so actually what you could call them an induced magne magnetosphere, what you do is you shield out the interior with these electrical currents that then deflect. So the way we have the Chapman currents causing the magnetopause, you can also think of currents associated with the ionosphere that deflect in close to the planet and deflect the solar wind around. And so conveniently for Venus and, and Mars, if you like, yes. <laughs> you do have that protection. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I can imagine it as the planet, a part of the layer of the atmosphere. Yeah. Let's say the upper uh, layer is ionosphere. Yeah. The solar wind is excluded. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. So those are often called induced magnetospheres. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Good. Good. Excellent. Are we pretty much back? Should we move on? If they're not here, well, it's their fault. Okay. So let's let's. Um, so what we were talking about was this communication between the planet and the magnetosphere, and there comes a point where you, um, you cease to communicate. And so there comes a point where um, the, the motions, either radial outflow or convective motions, are comparable to the alphane speed. And there you begin to decouple between the ionosphere and the magnetosphere, and you, you get this decoupling. And in fact, at Jupiter, the communication begins to break down. They begins to have arguments between the planet and the magnetosphere at about 25 RJ, which is, gee, surprise, surprise, it's where the aurora are, right? So the, these coupling currents are not completing, and you're getting um, uh, uh, arguments. We'll come back to what I mean by arguments, but you're having arguments between the planet and the magnetosphere. But by the time we get out to 60 RJ, the magnetosphere and the atmosphere have stopped talking, or the magnetosphere and the ionosphere have stopped talking. OK, so it gives you a sense of the structure. So manifestation of this argument between the planet and the magnetosphere are the electrical currents associated with the aurora. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the aurora of Jupiter in the ultraviolet light. And this very circular region here is the main aurora oval associated with those coupling currents between the magneto disk and the planet, right? So the planet trying to keep the plasma co-rotating. These dots what do you think that dot is? It's a current, yes. Do you remember I mentioned mega amp currents, million amp currents between EO and the magnetosphere? This is the manifestation of this. There's also a coupling current between Europa. It's kind of weak. You can maybe see it. Not too easy to see. And um, Ganymede is here. This is the end of that magnetosphere of Ganymede coupling to the planet. So these are the satellite ones. And then the ones that are highly variable in the center are due to this complexity of very dynamic outer magnetosphere breathing and moving around, and may be related to what's going on on the boundary. It isn't clear how open or how closed this whole volume is, and that is a major area of uh, study, particularly by the Juno mission at Jupiter. OK, so these are the main regions, a, a fairly uniform circular um, aurora associated with um, this coupling between the magnetosphere and the planet, and then the moon spots and the variable polar aurora. So um, people like Bob Ergen argued that, oh, it's got to be just like the Earth. That's what these Earth people always say. Um, that the coupling between EO and the, and the planet, uh, you're going to have some alphanic interaction but a lot of the currents are going to be driven by potential drops between uh, the planet and the moon. 
and this is going to accelerate particles that are going to bombard the planet and cause the aurora. OK. Uh, similarly, when we look at the aurora here, um, the same sort of argument was made, that you, you probably have to have some potential drops and some very kinetic processes above the planet to accelerate particles to make the aurora. Now, this is what we're finding. When we look with Juno, and we look at the infrared and the UV, we see a lot more structure. Gee, surprise, surprise. Name me a solar system object or anywhere in the cosmos where we get up close and get more higher resolution observations and it doesn't get more complicated. Do you know a place where you go look close and it gets simpler? Not so much. Not so much. So um, what we're seeing here is an indication of what's penetrating deep versus um, what, what is bombarding the upper layers of the atmosphere versus the deeper part of the atmosphere. And this is what's indicated by these colors uh, telling you energetic particles, less energetic particles. And you can see there's a lot of dynamic behavior in that aurora process. Now, what we were interested in and testing was when we have this coupling between the plasma sheet and the planet, what is driving the acceleration? Is that being driven by some kind of turbulence in the middle magnetosphere? And I think you've had some discussion of turbulence and turbulent heating. Could that be these electrostatic voltages accelerating particles uh, in close to the planet? Or could it be waves, again, alphane waves, um, uh, heating the particles? So we're trying to work out what could be the cause of the acceleration that causes the particles that bombard the atmosphere. So what we're finding is that, indeed, alphane waves seem to be playing a major role in the um, magnetosphere of Jupiter. And so what we see is, for example, here we have um, uh, hot electron. We have electrons being heated by alphane waves in fairly close to the planet. And what we see when we look at the particles as we fly through here is alphane wave heated partic particles, OK, electrons. OK, so think of it this way. If you had a battery, and you can think of a potential drop as a battery, and say you had a 100-volt battery or a 100-volt potential drop, your electrons are coming along and say this is negative and this is positive. So they're going to be other way around, positive and negative. They're going to be accelerated this way. So you've got a battery, 100 volts, electron coming in. What energy are the electrons going to be coming out? 100 volt battery. 100 electron volts, right? Pretty simple. You're going to accelerate these particles, and you're going to have a beam of 100 volt electrons going this way. Not this way, this way, right? Now, it turns out that when we fly through this region, we don't see that. We don't see a beam. We sometimes see beams. We actually see beams going both ways. Wow, that's weird. So the battery is sort of alternating. Weird. Alternating battery. Hmm. But we also don't see a single beam of a single energy. What we see is a, a, a power law to the distribution. So you will know that when you look at a velocity distribution, And I'm just going to do V. I'm not going to get into V put and V power, but say V, and you, and you have a Gaussian, right? It's going to be with, with like this, right? Now, what if you add energy to the tail? You're going to have a, a tail like this, right? You have acceleration, putting energy into the tail. We, that's what we see. It's not, a, it's not a, a beam up here, say my 100 volt EV energy up here, or you can do this as energy. Energy would be better. Let's just put energy here. But you can go between energy and, and velocity, right? So if you had a, if you had a potential drop or a, a, a battery, you'd end up with a beam, right? But we don't see that. We see a, a power law, OK? And that tells us that it's wave heating that is happening rather than um, it's wave heating that is happening to these electrons in here. 
So um, that is what we think is driving a lot of the auroral uh, power is coming from wave heating of the particles. And indeed, out here, what we're seeing is that um, the, uh, the, the ions further out here are getting um, heated by alphane waves that are interacting out in the plasma sheet. So we have turbulent heating out here by alphane waves out in the outer region. And then we have um, parallel beams, or not so much beams as, as, as parallel tails uh, in here that causes the aurora. OK, there's a question at the back. Yeah? Can we say easily that this particular power law is due to alphane waves? Um, hmm. I don't think it's that easy. What do you think? If you observe a power law of a certain power law, can you say it's a certain kind of waves that produce it? I don't, I don't, I don't. Not so easy. Yeah, it depends on too many other parameters, right? Because you've got a heating rate, you've got a transport rate, you've got a wave generation rate, you've got a, you know, the t an, an efficiency of conversion rate. There's too many parameters involved, right? Um, and the answer is you have to hire a theorist who's got a numerical code, you put it into your PIC code, you run the code. You maybe get an answer, but you've probably still got a lot of knobs to twiddle. Yes, these are kinetic alphane waves. Right. Yes. Yes, good point. These have to be kinetic alphane waves in this region. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, now, there are times where we see some beams. And we do see what's called an inverted V. Here's an inverted V. That tells you you've got a beam of energy. So we do sometimes have um, uh, uh, what we could think of as these potential drops, the batteries, if you like. These sort of sketches are supposed to imply that. But it's not as often as we thought it would be. And so we're finding these are things that are quasi-stable. We've got the coupling currents are not as stable, steady. We're seeing um, things are getting a little messier. Reality is messy. Gee, surprise, surprise. It's not as simple as, um, as you, we would expect. Simple theories would say. So let me just give you an example, which is kind of interesting. We take this magnetosphere. We have a plasma disk. We have some coupling to the planet. And what happens is as the stuff goes out, you would think that if you took a blob of plasma and you moved it out, it would cool. It's moving from a small volume into a big volume. And most gases, when they expand, cool, right? You know this from basic physics. But what's happening here is that, in fact, the plasma heats up as it goes out. And you're converting some of that rotational energy of the planet into, uh, via the field line currents, into heating up the plasma. This is observed. It's not very well described in terms of plasma physics models, but we know that's the case. Stuff moving inward from a weak field into a strong field. I'm sure you can come across adiabatic theory, where you can serve the first adiabatic inv invariant, and you heat up the plasma. It moves into a stronger magnetic field. And so uh, you seem to be having heating, heating both ways outwards and heating inwards. And so the net result is in the magnetosphere of Jupiter, you have a plasma beta, the ratio of the thermal energy density to the magnetic field energy density is much greater than 1. Okay, So that tells you there's a lot of thermal energy and much weaker field energy. There is nowhere in our solar system where you have a persistent large volume of beta greater than 100, except in the magnetosphere of Jupiter. Do you know of anywhere? Anybody? What, maybe in a machine? 
Do you make high beta plasmas in your in the machines at Princeton? Not as high as this. Okay. Jupiter beats them all, even Princeton. Okay. <laughs> okay. But this has consequences. You've got a high thermal pressure. There's major consequences. You begin to lose your plasma down the tail, either through what's called the ballooning mode instability, or you have kinetic transport, small-scale reconnection. You begin to lose the plasma. So basically, the, the frozen in condition becomes violated due to kinetic processes, and you lose the plasma down the tail. Furthermore, when we do our, our plasma pressure balance, right? And remember, Bob talked about this, and we looked at the um, chapman ferraro distance. You've got to add an extra term to your pressure balance because you've got this high beta plasma in here. And so the net result is that you have a very compressible magnetosphere. At Earth, remember, the magnetopause went as 1 over the ram pressure to the minus 6 power. For Jupiter, it's more like the minus 4. And the net result means that when you double the pressure of the solar wind, or rather go up by a factor of 10, you halve the size of the magnetosphere for, for Jupiter, where it's only 70% for the Earth. So this means the magnetosphere of Jupiter is very squishy, OK? Variation in the solar wind it causes this huge variation in the scale. That's why you get a scale of a back factor of 200 to, to 50 RJ. Whereas for the Earth, you get a relatively small. It's very rigid, right? It doesn't change much, even though you have very strong changes in the solar wind. OK, um, lastly, you know what? I'm going to skip this. Instead of the Dungy cycle, I'm just going to say we mentioned briefly there could be kinetic processes on the boundary. Um, we're going to call that the viscous interaction between the solar wind and the magnetosphere. We think this is important at Jupiter. I'm going to skip this. Um, and, and you might then think of Jupiter being a bit like a comet. The interaction, you're not driving a Dungy cycle, a global Dungy cycle. You've got interactions on the boundary. And the primary reason for this is you remember Bob did this calculation where he said if you have the solar wind moving at 40, 400 kilometers a second, it's going to close. And I've got here just going from the, from the uh, nose to the um, terminator, it takes about three minutes. Okay, the whole cycle is more like, what, 30 minutes, 20 minutes? For Jupiter, you do the same calculation given the size, that's about five hours. So five hours to do just this part. The rest of it's going to take even longer. So I think you measured 50 hours, something like this. Indeed. So you can see that the Dungy cycle is going to be thwarted by this. You just can't get steady upstream conditions for um, tens of hours in the case of Jupiter. And so the interaction is much more on the boundary rather than a global convection system. So these are the big differences between Jupiter and Earth. Uh, the difference in the plasma source, much stronger at Jupiter. The resident time, much longer at Jupiter because of the scale. Tapping the rotation rather than the solar wind energy. You've got local dynamics. You've got a lot of local stuff, a lot of turbulence, a lot of kinetic processes. And you have a large, hot plasma disk Whereas at Earth, you've got a relatively small, very dynamic uh, system driven by the solar wind interaction. Future missions to Jupiter. Uh, pay attention to Clipper. It'll go look at, at Europa and JUICE. It'll go to the magnetosphere of Ganymede. Um, you know what? I'm going to skip the difference between Jupiter and Saturn. It's interesting, but we'll skip it. Um, what you have, actually, because of a variety of factors, you end up with less energy, less ionization. And you end up at Saturn having the neutral density dominate over the plasma density. Very strange magnetosphere. So you have to think very differently. It's less about plasma physics, more about chemistry, which some people like and get excited by. Other people yawn. OK, so let's talk about Uranus and Neptune, because they're totally cool. So these are um, have interiors, water, ammonia, methane. Wham. 
I like to call it. And they are electrically conducting if you've got ions dissolved in them, say, salt or something like that. Okay? And you can drive a dynamo. You've got lower pressure, so you don't actually have enough. There's a lot of hydrogen in the atmosphere, but there's not enough pressures and not enough mass in these objects to have metallic hydrogen. So you have these very weak, irregular magnetic fields. Now, we've flown by once, Voyager, 1985, sorry, 86 and uh, 89. And we have one-off measurements, and this is where we have this very non-dipolar magnetic field. Now, what happens when you think about, you go through a rotation. Say you started off like this, and then you have, um, so the Voyager orientation was sort of like this, but you can imagine that you're going to have a complete change in the configuration from an Earth-like configuration to a really weird-like configuration within half a rotation. So Uranus rotates every, um, I think it's 14 hours. So every seven hours, you're going through a complete change in the configuration of the magnetic field. Similarly with Saturn, sorry, with, with Neptune, similar with, with Neptune, you get a complete change in the configuration because of this large tilt of the dipole. There's some hints of aurora taken with HST, but basically, that's it. One flyby each, lasting a few hours, and we have very little information. So we should go back. And we should go back when there's a different configuration. So for Uranus, we were around here, pole on, sorry, around here, pointed towards the sun. What we want to do is to go back in the early 30s and see it when it's tipped on its side. Then you're going to get a totally weird. Look at the changing configuration in these movies. Really, really strange and cool. Can you imagine flying spacecraft through all that, taking a whole bunch of data, finding out what's going on, testing ideas of the Dungey cycle in such a weird configuration? OK, so we need to do that. It's going to be tough um, to do this. You have to have some modern instrumentation. Maybe some onboard data processing, because it's a long way away. It's hard to get the data back. So think about this when, when you have your discussion of particle measurements and the guys who measure the particle instruments. This is going to be, what, on Monday or something? Saturday. Ask the guy about how he would make measurements at Uranus. So it's a long way to go. And if you go from, there's some studies of this, if you went from a You'd have to do some gravity assists at Earth, Venus, Earth, Earth, then Jupiter. And even if you did this, gaining a bit of speed each time, it's going to take you 12 years. Well, that's not the end of the world. New Horizons took nine and a half years to get to Pluto. So we've got the patience. We can do it. But it's a long way, a long way to get there, right? Uh, maybe what we could do is use the SLS. Is the SLS going to work? Of course it will. NASA does everything. Um, or we could use the Falcon Heavy. But we could get there maybe in a shorter time if we can find a way to slow down when we get there. Aero capture, perhaps? OK, so this could be your future. You could go study those weird, weird, weird magnetospheres under really cool conditions and work out what is going on. By studying these weird magnetospheres, you're testing your ideas about how the Earth works, how Jupiter works, right? how exoplanets might work. And you, you're able to test your theories by applying it to really strange conditions. So I think that would be totally cool. So here's an overall comparison. I'm not going to go through them. Um, and you can think about how these different magnetospheres will have different processes, different scales. Um, but it's really interesting when you look at these different ones, how different they are. Um, the, the Earth, Mercury, and Ganymede ones being relatively small, driven by reconnection. Um, rotation driving Jupiter and Saturn. And then these totally weird ones of Uranus and Neptune. 
We have a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter. It's called Juno. We have an orbit, a spacecraft in orbit around Mars. It's called Maven. And Bepi Colombo is on its way to Mercury. So planetary magnetospheres, there's a lot of stuff happening in the future. And with that, thank you very much. OK, I'm going to just take questions until people fall asleep or you shout that we should stop. OK, any questions? Yes? You cannot use solar power beyond Jupiter. We've shown with Juno that you can use it at Jupiter. But to be honest with you, beyond Jupiter 5 AU, it really gets to be difficult, right? 1 over R squared, it gets to be tough. So you need to use plutonium, plutonium-238 in a, a radioactive thermoelectric generator, or RTG. And making more of that, you have to make it in a reactor. It's not the bomb plutonium, that's 235. This is 238. And, um, but it's, it's, it's tricky to do, but that's what we have to do. We've been using that since Voyager and before. Yes, Lika. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you might be able to comment on that. Well, we could use nuclear electric propulsion, which is a good one. So there are three biggies. There's propulsion, there's power, and communication. Well, that's really OK, but it's hard to do that in the outer solar system. May I suggest another one, which I think will be cheaper? Why not increase the is on the ground? Take the deep space network and multiply it by a factor of 10. That would be easy and cheap, very cheap. Because of clouds, OK. OK, so you can see these are important things to think about. Power. We can, we, it is amazing to compare the power needed by Voyager, right, to have the instruments on Voyager compared with the power that we use on modern instruments. Modern instruments are small, they're lightweight, they're efficient, they use a lot less power than the original ones. And, and their communication, you still need a lot of communication. OK, so MMS, right? They are making these measurements. What did you say, 16,000 measurements per second? Right? Right. 
So think, of, think, think how many data points you're going to have to take, and how are you going to send that back from Uranus where you're not. But you have to think about maybe onboard data processing. You have to think about intelligent ways of using your data and processing it and sending back what's important. MMS actually throws away, what is it, 95% of the data? They only download the 5% in the places where it's key and interesting, like that electron diffusion region. And then they send it down by the bucketful. Okay. I, you know, I agree with Lika. Get creative. Think out of the box. Um, we have to find new ways of doing this stuff if we're going to go to the really cool places like your internet. You mean the fact? So I was a grad student and um, at MIT, and I only came over. I was just I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I thought, well, I'll just come over to the U.S. and I'll come for a year. And I arrived in July, around July 4th of 1976. Dana will tell you what happened on the 4th of July, 1976. It was the 200th anniversary of getting rid of those pesky Brits day. <laughs> so that was an interesting day to be arriving in, in America. Um, <laughs> anyway, and I was in Boston where they reenact every year, you know, like, just, let's kill off all those Brits. Anyway, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and um, I had done a, a graduate, a undergraduate project with John Hargreaves, the guy who, um, who wrote that book. And the project I had was actually analyzing data from Millstone Hill, which is in Boston, and analyzing the Earth's um, ionosphere, total electron content data. And I had sat in Lancaster University in Northern England with a big sheet of paper and this, this big book, plotting by hand these these data and was learning about sudden storm commencement and ionospheric currents and all sorts of stuff. And this got published. So I then went to MIT, that's probably how I got in um, as a master's thesis, and um, to do a master's. And I bumped into somebody and I, they said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm interested in space, do space physics. And they said, oh, you need to go talk to these people at the Center for Space Research. They're about to launch a, uh, a mission out to the outer planets. So I knocked on the door and I said, uh, I'm looking for a job. And they said, do you know how to analyze plasma data? And I said, sure. So they got me going analyzing plasma data. And so in those days, it was punch cards, Fortran, magnetic tapes. And I used to put nine magnetic tapes on each arm walk across campus to the computer center, give them the mag tapes, and I'd give them the box of cards. They would put the box of cards through the computer, and then I would come back the next day and find that I'd made a typo, and I had to correct the typo, and they would do it again. Anyway, those are the good old days of, of Fortran and analyzing data from, from Voyager. So that's my Voyager. Is that what you wanted? <laughs> okay. Yes, exactly. Knock on the door. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm lucky. Lucky, 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 lucky. But you know, if the right place at the right time, and you jump on it, right? With enthusiasm. With enthusiasm. You know, a smile goes a hell of a long way. Okay. I think people are running out of steam. I'll put those slides online, and then people have questions about Saturn. You can read about it. Oh, yeah? <laughs> 